OK, so we're, we're going to continue where we, where we left off um, from our last lecture, which is chapter 13. And we're doing lots of uh, different uh, examples of f is equal to ma. And so I'll, I'll, try to, I'll try to cover at least two, maybe even I'll get to the third example, and all, all different coordinate systems for a bunch of different examples. Um, and that's, so let's, start with, um, let's start with this one here. So I, I previously drew my, my well-known incline, well-used incline. My theta is 20 degrees in this case. And I believe I, believe I even hinted at it last time. I was going to have a block. And I have a spring. And I measure position of the block along the incline using a parameter x. So clearly in this diagram, we already know that we're really interested in using rectangular coordinates. And not only rectangular coordinates, but this, this sort of um, uh, rotated one that runs along the incline the way that I did with the car example on the, on the sloped incline as well. And so uh, the point of this problem is we're going to have a mass, but I'm actually going to apply a force. And I'm going to pull the mass down. So mass is pulled down the ramp. From rest at x is equal to 0. OK, so it's going to start at x is equal to 0. And it's going to be pulled down to x is equal to 0 0.5 meters. And so the spring is now stretched. by that amount, 0.5 meters. And the question is as follows. If you let go of the block, does it go up, does it go down, or does it stay stationary? OK, so it's one, it's one of these questions where um, it's kind of open-ended. We don't even know what the result is going to be. Very different than some of the other problems where we just tell you. right? We tell you the block is going to move up or move down. In this particular case, we don't even know yet, and you have to somehow figure it out. Um, and, and so the information that's given to you is, is uh, just right here in terms of the problem. Let me see what I have in terms of parameters. So along with the rest of the problem, we have a uh, static coefficient of friction mu s is 0.4. You're given that mu k is lower, 0.3. The mass has, or the mass is 10 kilograms. And we have a spring constant, 50 newton meters, newton per meter. OK, so that's all the information that's given to you. Now, how do you, how do you approach this problem? Um, so obviously, first thing is the free body diagram. So we're going to do a free body diagram. And we drew one very, very similar before. So there's our m. Here's our mg. Uh, here's our fn. It's pretty simple stuff. And then you've pulled it down. But you're basically holding it there, so you're not you're not really um, you're, you're gonna you're gonna actually let go. So if you let go of the block, that means no more force is being applied. But um, but there is obviously going to be a spring force here. So the spring force is F S pulling the block, trying to pull the block back up the incline. And then obviously there's friction between the block and the incline. So I'm going to put there F F. So our free body diagram should look something like that. And given that I have a theta on the incline, the theta exists there for my mg vector. OK, okay so, so, so where do we go from here? Basically, we don't even know if the block is moving or not, which means we still haven't figure it out yet whether the friction force is going to be mu s or mu k, if it's dynamic or kinetic. Where do we start? 
yeah, actually, we don't, we don't know which direction the friction acts, right? So that's another really good point. Um, we, we don't know which direction it is, but here's the thing. With problems like this, you always have to start somewhere, and the idea is you guess. OK, so I'm going to guess that it goes this way. Now, why did I guess that it goes this way? It basically means that without the friction, I expect the block to just keep sliding down. And so the friction force is really there to almost like keep the block from moving. And so if, if it were to slide, it's basically going to try to slide down. That's my basic assumption for now. And then if it's wrong, um, the, the answer is supposed to kind of give me an indicator with like a minus sign. OK, so, so, so that's, the, that's the plan here. We're going to have to guess. And you can pick anything to guess. But the idea is, remember when Professor Sinclair did that lecture on friction, and she compared the static and the, and the kinetic. She said something really, really important, which is that when you calculate the static, you always have this maximum value, right? So if you can figure out that there is a maximum friction associated with this mu s when you take this number, then that means any time the friction that's acting on the block is actually below that maximum, you know that the block is stationary. Right? So that's the key. So the thing I'm going to do is I'm going to guess that the block stays, okay? which means static friction. Okay? And I guess the direction as well. Guess the friction force direction is up the incline. OK, so now we can actually proceed with our sum of the forces in the x and the sum of the forces in the y. So sum of the forces in the x gives me max. And because I'm assuming that it's supposed to be stationary, I can say that this is going to be 0. And then, oops. And then the force balance indicates that it should be mg sine theta minus ff and then minus fs. So I can actually rearrange all this. FF is, so if it were stationary and there's no acceleration, I rearrange and calculate FF. And the FF that needs to be true in order for that to, the block to stay, it would have to be mg sine theta minus FS. FS is just a spring force, so it's just spring constant multiplied by the distance that the spring is stretched, which is x. And so let me fill in the numbers for you. 10 kg. Good. OK. So you calculate it out, move everything around. Friction force is equal to 8.55. Now's your, now's your time to actually do the check. So what do you check? You check for FF static max. Right? You're looking for the maximum value for static friction before things start to move. And this has to be my calculation mu s f n. OK, so all of a sudden, I actually need to figure out what my Fn is. What's Fn? Well, Fn comes from actually my y direction balance. So as it turns out, I need Fn, which is fine. How do we get Fn? Fn is sum of forces in the y is equal to may is 0. And the free body diagram shows me that this is Fn minus my mg cos theta. 
So clearly, Fn is just equal to mg cos theta. Okay. Okay, so now I can plug this back into my equation for the ff max. And so now I have my 0 0.4 mg cos theta. Okay, and my calculation says. 36.9 newtons. So the maximum static friction force due to this particular mu s is actually this. And as long as you're well below it, sure enough, the block is actually staying. So because, therefore, f, f less than f, f static max. Block stays. Okay, pretty pretty simple. Any questions on that? Oh, yeah. It's, OK, so, so it's a good question, and I should review this part. Um, the signs, the signs when you're doing these free body diagrams and putting down forces, really, really important, right? And, uh, and, and Leo's point here was the fact that I put down this x as my, as my position, uh, as my position coordinate, and x positive should be this way, right? Um, but here's the, here's the really important thing um, about this problem is if you remember the free body diagram that I drew, and I'll just quickly redraw it here. It looked like this. Mg, Fn, Fs, Ff. Right? So the key to the way that the, the, the vectors are drawn on the three body diagram is essentially the signs are already taken into account. If you're pointing the arrow that way and you're saying things like the following, you're saying, you know, mg sine theta is in the positive x minus ff. This minus sign already took care of the fact that you were pointing up the, up the incline. And same with this minus sign. Notice how fs, remember if um, I think Professor Sinclair would have showed you that the equation for fs, the spring, is oftentimes written, and even in your textbook, with this minus sign. right? And this minus sign has a very important meaning. The minus sign says, if you have an x coordinate and you move the spring to the positive x, the force of the spring has to be opposite the direction of that x. So if this is positive 0.5, then it should be pulling the block back up because the spring wants to return to its equilibrium position. This minus sign is telling you it's opposite the x. But this minus sign already accounted for it. I put a minus sign there, meaning that I already drew my arrow the right way. And I've taken that into account. So you don't need to do two minus signs because now you're, now you're going to now, now, now you're going to actually flip the sign the wrong way. Okay? Does that make sense? So bottom line is you're going to draw your vectors, try to draw them in an intuitive manner, draw them that, that in a way that agrees with the physics, and take into account the sign only once and don't do it twice. OK? OK. So that's, that's uh, you know, the simple version of the problem. And let me, now, let me now just change it up a little bit and say, you know, that was, that was an interesting first part of the question. What happens if I, you know, I'm really curious about how to make the block actually move down the incline or move up the incline? So I can start playing around maybe with the parameters. What happens if I, for instance, change the mass to be lighter, to be 5, five kilograms instead of 10? So let's change m to m is equal to 5 kilograms. OK? And, and all the. All the equations still apply. Free body diagram the same way. I'm going to make the same assumptions. So the assumption is friction force should go up, kind of keeping the block there because it wants to go down. Um, and let's, let's start with the idea that maybe it's static friction. Okay. So I'm going to plug in the numbers. 
FF is, it's the same equations, by the way, because I haven't changed anything with the problem. OK, so the only thing I've changed, this m, the mass. You calculate the f. Oops, let me do the actual numbers here. Minus 50.5, like that. OK, and the value ends up being negative. OK. So sure enough, in this particular case, the minus sign shows up. It's giving you an indication that you actually guessed wrong with the direction of your friction force. Right? So if you had actually guessed that the friction force was the other way, right, that it was actually pointing down, then, then you would have actually had a positive sign because you would have done this. You would have had m, fn, mg, fs, and now my friction force is this way, as if to say, oh, I'm going to stop the mass from moving up the incline. And all of a sudden, your force balance will end up being this is equal to negative this plus that giving you a positive number. Then your friction force, the direction was guessed right. OK? So what exactly happened there? It makes a lot of sense. The mass was originally 10 kilograms. It was a heavy block. And so the idea was, if you just left it to sit there alone, it would have actually wanted to move down the slope if it was like a really slippery surface, and friction was holding it back up. But when you lower the mass to 5 kilograms, the mass is so light that the spring has a tendency to want to pull it up and friction force was keeping it from being pulled up. OK? So there you go. You can play around with the numbers, change the mass, and that's what happens. And now, so these are both cases where the static friction was at play, and I still haven't gotten to a case where there was dynamic friction. So why don't we try that? What can I do to actually make it move? So it seems like a really, seems like a really good idea. Maybe I can just make the mass heavier. What happens if I do 20 kilograms, 30 kilograms, just make it heavier, force the block to come down? So I'm going to ask this one question. What mass would actually slip down the incline? So what mass would actually slip down the incline? OK, so how do we deal with this? This is the idea that in this equation, where I have you know, sum of forces in the x is max is equal to, what is it again, mg sine theta minus kx minus ff. OK? So in this equation, in order for the block to move, I have to overcome the highest possible static friction. So the friction that should be here is actually, if you've subbed in, ff static max, the one that we previously calculated. right? And if it's just heavy enough, it will overcome the static friction, and it will just begin to move. And so I'm going to set it to be equal to 0, because that's as close as it's going to, it's going to get to just about, um, just about to move. So now I can rearrange things, and I can actually isolate this m here, the mass, and figure out what mass will actually let it slip. So let me write this out. Uh, it should be the following, mg sine theta minus kx. And this static friction force, the maximum, is going to be the negative mu s f n. And we previously noted that it was mu s m g cos theta, like that. And so there's actually two m's. I'm going to now rearrange. So rearranging m would be equal to kx. G 
g sine 20 minus mu s g cos 20, like that. OK? So k is my 50, x is my 0.5. Nine point eight one Okay, plug it all in, and then I get the following value. Mass is mass is negative. Okay. So what happened? <laughs> Why is the mass negative? Yeah. Did I do the friction the wrong way? Possibly. Yeah. So I, I could have done the friction the wrong way, but the question was, you know, was was very specifically worded this way. So I'm not interested in the mass moving up. I was clearly asking for what mass would actually slip down the incline, the negative sign actually says, I don't think that's possible. Yeah. Right? Why is it not possible in this particular case? Yeah? Uh, maybe it's just because I had uh, chosen x side mass. Maybe I shouldn't have chosen. No, this, this part's correct, right? So you still have to, you have to get the, the friction force to be completely maximum before you can overcome it, overcome the, the, the static friction in order for it to move. Yeah, go ahead. The static friction increases more. Yeah, OK, so, so I, I, I just want to may, maybe direct you to the actual formula, right? Why, why would this number ever be negative? If you look at the numbers, it could actually give you some insight. It's negative because down here, there's this value minus this. It means that this somehow is just bigger. It's bigger than this, and that gives you a minus sign. Somehow that's not, that's not working. How do, I, how do I ensure that this number is actually bigger than this so that I have a positive mass? I somehow make this smaller. How do I make this smaller? Mu s can be a smaller value, which means the surface is more slippery. So right now, the surface is not slippery enough, so there's no mass that will ever go down this incline, right? The other way to make this value smaller is if this incline is a, is a, is a bigger angle. So if cosine of a bigger angle, like 45 degrees or 60 degrees, all of a sudden, even with that static coefficient of friction, there's a chance the mass will come down. So it's all sort of buried in this part of the equation. There's some insight there that tells you it's all about the slope and the slipperiness of the surface. Okay? So pretty interesting. Oftentimes, I think the whole point of this problem was, look, you can have various scenarios. Sometimes the minus sign can kind of throw you off. Doesn't even make physical sense. But when you look a little bit, if you dig a little deeper, there is actually some physical meaning there as long as you've approached the problem the right way. OK? Yeah? Why do you always assume that f of x is 0? Why do I always assume that f of x is 0? So I'm, I'm going to stop assuming that very, very quickly in a lot of these other problems. But like in the first two problems, remember we're dealing with friction, and we don't currently yet know what type of friction it is. And even Professor Sinclair said this. When you don't know, you've got to start somewhere. You've got to make an assumption. So you're, you're very welcome to start the other way. Start with kinetic friction. Typically, it's way easier. Start with static. Things don't move. Then, then ma is just equal to 0, right? Now, if this doesn't check out, if your friction force needs to be super high and needs to be greater or is calculated to be greater than this value, then you know that you guessed wrong with static then you have to go back to kinetic friction. OK? OK, we'll do some more examples of that as well. OK? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so just to clarify, the negative sign is just based on there is no mass that can make the bottom. In this particular instance, this minus sign says it's not possible. To answer this question, no mass in the given situation with that mu s and that theta is not going to work. OK, so let's move to another problem. 
you see what I got here. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna put the um, the problem on the on the projector screen here. Take one and pass it up. 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 See if that works. Okay, does everyone have a copy of this problem? So I, I'll, I also have it on the projector screen here so that we can go over it together. Let's see if I can dim the lights here. Okay. All right. Everyone, everyone got a handout? No? Anyone have extra handouts? Pass them up. Who needs one? Pass it around to anyone else. OK. So we've got a problem here, and, um, and it's a, a, a boy, a young child, who's going to go down this slide, and the slide is a helix. OK. So it says the boy's mass is 40 kilograms. There's a spiral slide, uh, and he's moving at constant speed. And the position can be measured with a few equations, right? So it says uh, r is constant. So this entire spiral slide has the same radial component the whole time, 1.5 meters. And then theta, change in angle, is a linear function with respect to time. So it basically just means that as he's going around the slide, his angle is changing the same amount all the time. Okay? And then z, he's also descending the slide, so he's dropping in elevation, also in a linear fashion, z is equal to ct. Determine the components of fr, f theta, fz. So huge clue there. Basically, what are we dealing with? Polar coordinate system. Um, and and, and the, the, the forces which the slide exerts on him at the instant of t is equal to two seconds. OK? So that, that's, the, that's the idea behind the problem. So let's see how we deal with this. This is actually a problem in your textbook. OK, so we, we already showed you the equations for fr, f theta, fz. Right? In one of the lectures, I just basically wrote it out. And you take the form of that acceleration, the component, the ar, a theta, az, and you just multiply it by mass. So what they're asking you here is actually really straightforward. It all comes down to how you orient your axes properly in this r theta z space. So I want you guys to think about this helix again. So if I draw the full slide, I imagine it to be something like that. So it's a helical slide. And this part right here is the radius of curvature. Basically, how far you are from the center axis. So this is my r is equal to 1.5 meters. 
Okay. And the way I've drawn it, this is my z axis. It's upward. And r theta means that you're always going to be the radial position vector pointing outward. So it just depends on where you are. Now, if I put my box right here, so if my boy, my boy is a particle on this slide, and it's on this right hand side of the, of the helix. Okay. What should, the, what should the three vectors look like extending from this position? So our vector here, this is my ur, right? And this is my uz, okay? And he's going around in this fashion. It's uh, counterclockwise. So u theta is always 90 degrees perpendicular to ur, and u theta is into the board, okay? So u theta is into the board. In fact, Probably the best way to do this is if I do both top views and side views. So if I do a top view, top view of the boy, and the boy is going to go this way. This would be my u theta. This would be my ur. Right. So now that's my top view. In fact, let me draw. Okay, so the boy is going to face into the board, and that's my top view. And here's my side view. Oh, let me just draw it here. Okay, so now that everyone has it, let me just. Do that. Okay, so that's my top view. Here's my side view. There's my, there's my boy, sort of. OK? So I'm just trying to, I'm trying to look at it from all different angles. This side view just means that you know, the, the boy is sliding down the slide, and there's, a, there's an incline to it. In fact, this incline is going to have an angle. Angle was never really told, told to you, but we can kind of figure it out. Um, and then the uz is still pointing up, and then the u theta is in this direction, because that's in the direction of it going around in the helix. Okay? So here's, the, here's what the free body diagram should look like. You should see something like this. It should be like, a, like an m with an mg down, and then a fz pointing straight up. Okay, and then in the orientation of this guy, in my u z u r coordinates, so this is my u z u r again. Okay, so this is this picture. All right, there has to be a force f r like that. Okay, so maybe there's a there's a force pushing the child f r outward in the radial direction. There's a force maybe pointing straight up, the fz, and then f theta is around this way. Right? So this, is my, this would be my fz, and this is my f theta, like that. Okay. OK, so the, 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 the math is actually going to be really, really easy. The idea is as follows. Um, remember your u r, u theta, and u z directions in your 
sum of forces in the R. It's m a r, and so this is just m times your, you know, r double dot minus r theta dot squared. Okay, and then sum of forces in the theta is m a theta. That. Okay, and not only do we know that, but the way that the, the, the question was worded, it's basically saying let's just lump forces together into one component at a time, f r f theta f z. The entire sum of forces in the way that I've drawn this diagram is literally like this. It's just f r, it's just f theta, and it's just f z minus m g equal to zero. Like that, right? So I'm basically saying I don't quite know what f theta and f r yet is yet, and I don't know what what is what is combining to give me those forces. But I'm just going to give it that one that one variable. Yeah. Um, where is f theta? So f theta is right here. So on because it's three dimensional, I've given you this side view, and in the side view where it's u z u theta. Looking at it from this angle, f theta is here. Okay, so it's it's like it's like because the slide is sloped this way, there's a bit of it that pushes the child forward, and that's my f theta. Okay, okay, yeah. So because it's polar coordinates, remember this is three dimensions. But if it's two dimensions, what did we say? We said it's basically a slice of it at z is equal to 0. So imagine the slice of it. What does that mean? u r and u theta would have to be in that plane, in that slice. And it would have to be horizontal. Okay. OK, so let's do the math. Basically, I need a lot of uh, derivatives. So I'm going to summarize my derivatives here. And then I'm going to do some substitutions. So my derivatives are as follows. r is constant. So r dot is 0, r double dot is 0. And then theta is 0.7t. So theta dot is 0.7. Theta double dot is 0. And then z is 0.5t, z dot is 0 0.5, or negative, negative 0 0.5, and z double dot is 0. OK? So those are all the derivatives. Now I can just do some quick substitutions. So it looks to me like fr is m. So it'll be mr double dot minus r theta dot squared. r double dot is 0. So that's just 40 negative 1.5. And theta dot is my 0.7. Negative 29.4 newtons. OK. F theta is my m r theta double dot plus 2 r dot theta dot. And it actually turns out that these are both 0. So f theta, as calculated with this method, is just 0. And fz is actually just equal to mg. Right. 
And by the way, it's because, it's because when I did my z double dot, z double dot is a z, right? So z double dot is a z. This is mz double dot. You can, you can check the equations that you've previously had in that section. And because I know that z double dot is 0, I basically sort of skipped ahead a little bit, but that is equal to 0. Okay? And so fz is equal to mg, and if I multiply 40 with 9.81, 392.44. OK, so that's, that, that's the answer. Those are just the numbers for fr, f theta, fz. But how do we actually interpret it, and does it really make sense to you? Why is, why is f theta 0? It would, it would appear to me that f theta should at least have a little bit of value that's non-zero. It seems to me like there's a slope on this, on this, on this slide that is pushing on the boy. So what do all these values mean? OK. So here, here's, here's some thoughts. First of all, the first thing is this minus sign. What does the minus sign mean for fr? It actually means that it should be pointing inward, not outward. So the ur vector points outward. But we all know that because the boy is traveling in a circular motion, it's actually like in nt coordinates, the un is pointed inward, right? So the un normal vector is saying, you know, there's, four, there's an acceleration inward, the an. And that centripetal acceleration is therefore pointing in, and the force is inward. So that's the minus sign there. It just basically means it should be pointing the other way. Okay? This one just makes sense. It means that, obviously, something is pushing up on the boy, opposing its mg. So it makes a lot of sense that this would be um, the same as just mg. So what do we do with this f theta? So I want to just make sure that you think a little bit more carefully here. The way I drew this diagram, it's a little bit interesting. This is clearly a slope. So why didn't I do the normal diagram for a slope where I have a block? Shouldn't I have normal forces and friction forces? So if I redrew this free body diagram, it should be mg. The normal force is actually perpendicular to the surface. It's actually angled. So, so if you drew the diagram this way, that clearly tells you Fn is not the same as Fz, right? Not the same thing. Along this incline, friction force is also at this particular angle. And we know it has to be kinetic friction because the boy is moving, right? So what just happened there? Basically, the component of Fn pointing in this positive theta direction is canceling out the friction force that's in the negative u theta direction. So I can break these two, ve these two vectors down into its component parts, one like that, one like that, one like that, and one like this. And it makes a lot of sense. Those components are actually acting against each other. Some of those forces are 0. Why? Because in this problem, the speed was constant, right? The actual speed along that slide, the, ch the child was never changing its speed. Therefore, there can't be any forces in the theta direction. So these two are actually balancing each other. Okay? So there's a bit of a deeper meaning here. The question was worded the way that I showed you on the sheet. It was worded specifically to ask you fr, f theta, fz. You got to listen to what the problem is asking you. But on the other hand, the real problem should be drawn like this, the way that we've always been doing, fn with ff, et cetera. Okay? Does that make sense? OK, good. Now, now one, more, one more question, this angle here, this, this angle theta, or I think I said alpha over there. Any idea how you might actually get at alpha? Do you, do, you have some, do you have some way of maybe even deducing it from all of the parameters that were given to you? Yeah, go ahead. Say that again? Tan inverse of fz over fr. So you're using the forces. I'm not sure you have to use the forces. I think you just need geometry here. So focus on the geometry. Right? So pic picture this, right? This triangle that I drew on this one little bit of the slide, it's actually as if this triangle was wrapped around to create a helix. 
Okay? So I'll give, you, I'll give you a quick little demonstration. It's kind of like this. If I took this triangle, right, and I wrapped it around like that, right, this is essentially the top hypotenuse is my helix. Okay? So in other words, if I went one revolution around, I did 2 pi theta, right? So I did, if I did 2 pi all the way around, I actually know exactly how far I've dropped, right? So how do I know that? Because the information that was given to you was as follows. You were told that z is equal to negative 0.5t, and theta was equal to 0.7t, and these are both linear. So what does that mean? If t was one second, you'd fall this much and move this many radians. So this triangle here with my alpha, how far you fall would be the 0.5. How far you travel along the, the, the slide is actually r theta. So that would be 1.5 times 0.7 radians. Okay? And therefore, you know that tan alpha is equal to opposite over adjacent. So 0.5 divided by 1.5 times 0.7. Because it's a distance, and theta is just an angle. So it's like the arc length. You're calculating an arc length. Okay? So the final angle, alpha, is actually, you can check this at home, 25.46 degrees. Okay? So lots of hidden information in this problem. Um, so today I managed to just cover two problems. Uh, I won't be here on Friday again. This is the last time I'll be substituted out of the lecture. But Professor Sinclair will be here on Friday. And she'll do probably some NT coordinates and maybe some other R theta coordinate type examples. OK? So I'll see you next week, Monday. I should be here for the rest of the semester. Thanks, guys.